Praise the Lord, everybody. It's Wednesday night. It's the middle of the week. Um, I'm sure some of you are a little tired. It's kind of one of those days, like, if you just get through this day, oh, you can make it. You can make it through the rest of this week. So tonight, I hope that you all will worship with us. God is worthy of the praise no matter what. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what the situation, God is worthy of our praise. that you're faithful. God, that we can call upon your name and we know, Lord, that you're there, that you're listening. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Hallelujah, for you are risen, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. You know, you never you never know why God put some people in your life and things that, that God puts them there for, for, for us and for a purpose, for a reason. Um, over the last, well, not 
this last, well, not the last week, but about a week, week and a half, I had the opportunity to, to meet with different individuals that had different beliefs. And one of them was actually here Sunday. And, and having that discussion with him and what that ended up doing with all of them, it prepared me for a discussion with somebody else that needed it on Sunday. And it has encouraged that young man. And while I was honestly to some degree semi-frustrated with the other three conversations that I had, it all led to the one that needed to be had. And this young man is, is seeking and wanting after the Lord and wanting after the Holy Ghost. And so I'm encouraged by that. And I said all that to say this, is that there are people uh, like that, that are asking for prayer. Brother, Sister, uh, Brother Russell, Sister Irma, um, they still need our prayers. They do. I don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis. And that should drive me to want to pray for them even more so. I talked to my boss today, Jamal, and he was borderline in tears when I told him, if I'm not there to call out you and your daughter, my pastor and my church do. And he started to just ball up in tears. It's, it's being the church that makes a difference. And being the church, we know the healer. And people see that. And they know that there's something unique about us. So just as we mentioned Brother Russell and Sister Irma and Ava and, and her mom and dad, Marsha and Jamal, uh, we want to remember Sister Joyce's request for John for healing and cancer from cancer and Donald's friend Tom. And I'm asking the church, please continue to pray for J.R. and Jasmine. And baby Ellie. Because even though it may seem like everything's okay, I want the Lord's hand in it to know that it's okay. And we want to continue to pray for our family in Front Royal. Our family. And, and I just want to say this real quick and I'll be quiet. When Saul went and, and saw Ananias, I, I'm sorry. Was that that wasn't it? When he went to go see that fella in Damascus, he called him brother Saul. And this is before he was born again. So I want to encourage you. There are brothers and sisters out there that are waiting to be born. You just don't know it. Unseen faces. You just ain't seen them yet. You may have seen them, but you ain't seen them born yet. Hallelujah. So tonight. If you, have an, if you have a prayer request, why don't we do it with the lifting of hands and, and call out that name when we're praying tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you, God, Lord, that we can call upon your name. Lord, you see those, Jesus, that are lost, God, and our families that have decided, Lord, that, that they could handle it on their own. I pray, God, for our prodigals that you would touch their hearts wherever they are. Remind them, God, of your power, your authority, your love. Jesus. I pray, Lord, tonight, God, that you would touch Brother Russell and Sister Irma, Lord, where they are in their home, where they're listening. Lord, you see Ava, Lord, that precious baby, God, would you just heal her, Lord, tonight. Lord, thank you, God, for the time that John, uh, Jamal and Marcia had with her. Lord, tonight you see John and you see Tom, Lord, and healed for cancer, God, that you would touch their bodies, Lord, where they are. Let them stand up, rise up, Lord God, knowing that you've done a miraculous work in their body with the power and the strength of your spirit. Lord, you see my daughter, Jasmine, and my son, Lord, J.R., and that baby, God, Ellie, I pray that you would strengthen her parents, Lord, and just protect her as she makes her way into this world. And God, Help us, Lord, as we strengthen, Lord, coming together. Lord, that you would just reach down and have your way in front royal. Lord, that you'd have your hand in Culpeper, God. That you would strengthen our Spanish work, Jesus. And, Lord, that you'd use us for your will and your direction. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Let's say it like we believe it. Amen. Praise God. Uh, just real quick, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, this Saturday, 
Uh, we have youth breakout at 2 p.m. at the church. I can't promise you the men won't still be here. If we have a Holy Ghost move, we might still be here. Praise God. But if you're here and you're going to be a part of that youth breakout, parents, if you're sending your young people, please send them with a couple of dollars. That sure would be helpful for the things that they got going on. Amen. Also, that morning, 730, men, right here, men's prayer breakfast. It's been a little bit. We've had a couple of things come up, but we're going to do it this Saturday. Uh, June 25th. Bible Museum. Men, you done missed it twice. So we're opening it up to the families of the church. If you would like to attend as a family on June 25th, let me know. Okay, it's $14 a person. We're prepaying for tickets. We've already got 14 tickets right now. So if you would like to go, please let me know. Go ahead and prepay. You can do it online. You can put it in the, in the envelope, whatever it is that you need to do. Amen. And if you're ready, we're going to go ahead and give unto the Lord this evening. Praise God. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for an opportunity to be here tonight to give. Lord, I ask that you would bless those, God, that give and those that cannot. I ask, Lord, that you would just use... This, this money, Lord, the giving, the offering for your will, for your kingdom, Lord. Let it apply, Lord, where you'd have it to go. Let it do, Lord, what you'd have it to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may give unto the Lord this evening. Author of 
Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Amen. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this evening. And I'm glad you're here. Are we having kids' classes? We're done. You're stuck in here. (laughs) The adults are clapping and screaming. The kids are moaning. Amen. You may be seated this evening. It is truly good to see you in the house of the Lord, braving the scattered thunderstorms as they dance around us. I tell you, we'll get no rain because the Secret Service people have the dome closed. We don't need it right now. (laughs) I'm teasing. I don't have a clue. What are you talking about? I just like to pretend. Amen? I asked Abby the other day. She was riding her bike around the parking lot here and and I know what I, when I rode my bike like that, I was pretending to do something. And so I just watched her for a while, and she came and parked her bike. And I said, so where were you headed? She goes, oh, I was headed to Virginia Beach. <laughs> I hope it was a good ride. Amen. <laughs> I love it. Amen. We're so blessed, and it's so good to see everybody. We had a great time on Pentecost Sunday. We had 96 in the house. And uh, what a great blessing to, to see everybody here. We had some guests in attendance, and I'm so thankful for what God is doing. And I am believing that the best is coming. We're on the very brink of it. And I want to do everything in my power to, uh, to, for God to trust me with the harvest. I hope you hear, Pastor. I want to do everything in my power for God to trust me with a new soul coming into this house. And uh, whether, that is, that, whether that soul has a, a fairly clean past and just needs salvation, I know we're all, no one's without sin, don't get me wrong. It could be somebody who comes in and they're bound in addiction of some degree, drugs, alcohol, uh, whatever. There's a lot of things to be addicted to. I want God to trust me with that soul. If it's a backslider who's experienced and had church hurt, or whatever the plethora of things that take place uh, in, in, a, uh, in a life that has uh, strayed from God, I want God to trust me with that soul that they can come here and they can find love, they can find Jesus Amen. more than they can find me. Amen. John Carlo, Teresa, and Jalinda, we're glad you're home from your trip. God bless you. I'm glad you had safe travels. We're going to Acts chapter 21, and uh, uh, right in there, uh, verse 17. Amen. We're, we're going to do our best to wrap this up tonight. And uh, if you'll behave, we'll be able to do it. <laughs> Y'all are like, no, Pastor, if you could behave. That's not going to happen, so I'm not, <laughs> not going to try. <laughs> I'm teasing. Amen. I tell you, I've had such a, such a good couple of days. I, can I testify for a moment? Uh, we had a good Bible study last night on Tuesday night. So maybe, we, maybe we'll get through, maybe we won't. We're going to end it tonight no matter what happens. Um, but uh, we had a good Bible study last night. Brother Victor was on there. And Brother Victor, as you know, does seal coating and striping of parking lots. And he did our parking lot and did a very excellent job uh, in that. But he hauls these big trailers around, these big drums that stir that stuff and heat it so that it applies correctly. And he was on, uh, he had rented a, a trailer and a tub, whatever you call it. He had rented one. The guys at the rental place had hooked it up for him. And on uh, Interstate 95, it bounced off the ball. And, of course, you have safety chains that then do this kind of stuff. And by the grace of God and protection, uh, he was able to make it from three lanes over to the shoulder. He had to go across three lanes dragging that and make it to the road. It ended up popping off again. 
in a residential area, and he just called the rental people and said, you, we got a problem. Come to find out uh, there was wrong things involved, and um, they should have paid closer attention. But I'm thankful for God's protecting hand on Brother Victor. I love Brother Victor. And when we pray, I pray, God, your hand of protection over my family. I, when I say family, I say you. It's hard to name everybody because I don't want to miss anybody. But I'm so thankful that God demonstrates his power. And I told him that earlier Tuesday I had prayed, God, demonstrate yourself in our lives so that we can see you and that our faith would be renewed and recharged. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to sign up with a trailer hopping off the hitch and a scary moment down 95. But God doesn't. He doesn't just ask me what I want. He says, you asked for a demonstration of my power, my glory, my protection, so here it is. It's a boost to our faith that God is still working, that God is still protecting, that God is still providing, that God's still making a way. I tell, you what we, I tell you what we need is we need a host of sinners coming to this house, be filled with the Holy Ghost, and set by somebody who just got a, got a good dose of that fire and that power. It would turn us upside down because they don't know how to do ch church proper like we do. Now, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but I, I want God's power and glory to be manifest in my life so that I, I don't start looking at something else trying to get my fix or get my peace or get, get my rest. My rest comes from him. My peace comes from him because he's demonstrated that in my life. That's good preaching. I, I'm not trying to say it's... I'm just telling you, I'm praying that God demonstrates himself in your life. Don't be surprised when something comes unexpectedly or there's a, there's a situation and he steps in and removes the car or removes the danger or provides financially or, or provides in a healing in your body. It's just pastor's prayer coming to fruition that I'm, I'm demonstrating myself to you so that you know that I'm still here. All right, that was free. Amen. So I, I, the whole point to that was is we've had a crazy two months. Has it been two months? It feels like two years. Not two years. I'm, to, I'm teasing. With the COVID thing and the moving thing, it's just been weird. That's a good word for it. And uh, we, we've got settled in. Almost everything is in its place. And Sister Jan, on Monday, I told my wife, I'm not doing nothing. I'm not doing anything today. I don't mean to be a double negative, but I'm not doing anything today. I'm not going to do anything. And I, I woke up, had devotions. I sent you all a picture of that. Just, you know, that's, we got to find a place to rest. We got to find a place to be recharged. The devil is out to wear you out. He's determined. Some of us are so busy because we don't know how to say no. And the devil's like, go ahead, keep on saying yes to that. I, I told somebody this week, I said, I'd rather you tell me no and be in a healthy place spiritually rather than be wore out and, and dreary and, 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 harm, and, and being hurt. Amen? And so you got to find rest. And so I, after that devotion, I went and I took a bike ride. And uh, it was so nice. I learned that I need new brakes on my bike. They don't stop, they slow down. <laughs> Amen. And, and I got home. Tiff and I, we had a little, uh, we had leftover Chipotle outside the trailer. Just her and I. We told the kids to stay inside. No, I'm teasing. They're, they won't come outside, lazy things. Uh, they're, they're taking summer break literally. <laughs> Amen. So we had a little Chipotle there on the little table. And uh, she got busy doing some, She got busy sitting in her chair because she said, I'm taking the day off. I said, I'm going to go on another bike ride. There's somewhere else I want to go. There's an old golf course back here one street or a couple streets over that the, pay, the driveways are still there and you can drive all the way back to Lake Manassas. Why am I sharing? I got a point. You go all the way back. Today I got up. I said, I'm going to go for another bike ride and I almost overdid it today. I told the Lutes I passed out three times but I made it back to the trailer. I didn't pass out three times but I thought, you know, the sidewalk was moving in front of me. And, uh, but I, I was in a place though on Rollins Ford right over here on my right was a cornfield. The, the corn is just about this tall. And on the left was some beans. I'm, I'm suspecting soybeans, but I'm not certain. And I could, there's, the cert, there's a certain smell that comes. Brother Clay, you know what I'm talking about. You only get it on a gravel road or a dirt road. There's the smell. And I immediately wharfed back to Newport, Arkansas on a gravel road. And I thought, God, you just I, just, I felt his presence in a way I hadn't felt it in a long time because I've been too busy. 
I'm trying to speak to somebody. I know this, this, ain't, this ain't going to get us to chapter 28, but I'm trying to help somebody. I was able to slow down. I don't know about you, but I need a pastor in my life that's rested and refreshed. All right? So I'm not trying to say, well, you go work and slave or whatever. I got plenty of work to do. Amen? Plenty of catching up to do. But I, I, I want to encourage you, saints, to take a moment. And I believe you should do it every day. Some people say it once a week or once a year or whatever. I think you can do it five minutes in a day. I think you can do it for 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day. And take a moment and just turn it off. Turn the phone off. Whoever needs you can get you later. Turn everything off and just go to that place where you can say, I'm listening, God. We need to hear from God. And we need to be able to get to that place where we can hear from God. And there's just too much busyness. And so I hope you receive what pastor is sharing with you. Uh, I've, got, I've been very blessed in my spirit and time with God. And, and uh, it was funny. I was sitting there talking to Brother Will before service, talking about the service. And we've kind of switched roles. He's had a crazy busy week, and I've been able to ride my bike. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for God's rest. Amen? Pastor is still working. There's grass to be mowed, people to be called, calendars to be made, okay? I'm not taking the summer off. Hallelujah. I, I just can't do it. Chapter 21 of Acts. Let's hit the road running. So Paul, the section of my Bible says that Paul goes to see James. He's headed to Jerusalem. And of course, they, they meet up here together. I'm, I'm going to be very quickly, very quick running through some of this. Um, in verses 27 through 36, Paul is asked to join four other men. Uh, as he gets to Jerusalem, Paul wants to go to church. But Paul has been around Gentiles. And of course, the Jews have some requirements about entering into the temple. And so they ask him to enter into seven days of purification before he enters the temple. And so he does that. He honors that, and they, they take that seven days of purification so that he can go to church. And so as he goes, uh, he begins to, he, everywhere he goes, he talks about Jesus. He's not laid off of the subject. He never does, really. Uh, he, obviously, he does a lot of instruction in the, in the New Testament to the church. He's talking to saved people how to stay saved and how to treat each other and how to treat others who are outside the church, of course, uh, in a lot of varying ways there. The crowd, again, uh, they, they become stirred up, and there's always somebody stirring them, and it's the ultra-religious Jews. And they're stirring up the people. The crowd begin to beat Paul. They desire to kill him. And so they, uh, it's, uh, the Roman, as we know, uh, Israel, Jerusalem is occupied by Roman authorities. The Roman authorities, they step in and they really kind of detain Paul, but at the same time they're protecting Paul from the crowd. Now, before this though, and this was last week's, uh, in the beginning of chapter 21, we, we learned that Agabus, they're having a meeting, Agabus comes he picks up a girdle. He doesn't know whose girdle it is. He wraps himself in that girdle and says, whoever this belongs to is about to be detained, arrested. Well, here is that prophecy being fulfilled as, as it's very likely that Paul had soldiers on both sides of him handcuffed or tied to both of them. The crowd is shouting away with him. They're done with him. And so... Uh, We've, we've got to be careful. Can I say this? Can we, we've got to be careful getting stirred up by every little whim and stupid thing out there. Forgive the language. We've got to be careful what we get stirred up by. Amen. You, you, I'll, I'll move forward. Verses 37 through 40, Paul addresses the Jerusalem mob. He's given an opportunity. He asks, can I, can I talk to them? And so he motions for them uh, to quieten down. What they think is, they believe that Paul is a man who some years later, I can't remember if it was two or three years later to this, uh, he was an Egyptian who led a revolt in Jerusalem. About 4,000 people were involved in that. They think that Paul is that man returned to cause trouble again. Paul denies that. He's given permission to speak. And he quietens the crowd. And so in, in chapter 22, he addresses the crowd. Verse 1, men and brethren and fathers, 
Hear ye my defense, which I may make known unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. Paul then qualifies himself. Not only are they giving him some space to talk, but when he's speaking in Hebrew, there, there's a connection there. Verse 3, I'm, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a man in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye are all this day. And he follows that by testifying about his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And he tells them that in that trance that he was told to leave Jerusalem and, 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 and because they will not receive the testimony. I'm sorry, not during a trance, all right, to leave. And he's talking about Jesus. And so uh, he identifies that he is the one that, and I'm skipping down here. We're talking about um, down in verse 20, that he identifies as he's the one who was standing at Stephen stoning. In verse 20 of verse 20, uh, chapter 22, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, he, he's trying to talk to the crowd and, and tell them his intentions. His intentions are pure. He's trying to connect the dots, as we know. And the crowd, again, are stirred away with them. They cast off their coats. They're throwing dust in the air, causing a stir. And so the chief captain of the Roman guard, they take Paul into the castle, into the fortress to protect him. Paul is beaten, but then he mentions that he's a Roman. Uh, he's about to be beaten. I'm sorry. He's about to be beaten. He mentions that he's a Roman, and so that avoids, uh, he avoids that beating, and he is loosed over to the chief priest and the councils. The Romans don't want to deal with this. They're like, this is a, this is a, a law issue, a Jerusalem, a religious issue, if you will. And so they don't want to mess with it. So then we get to verses 30. All the way over to chapter 23, verse 11, and Paul addresses the council. Now he's standing before the chief priest and the council. And Paul earnestly, this is verse 1, beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. And Paul responds very quickly and sharply, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commanded you command me to be smitten contrary to, contrary to the law. And so some speculate that, thank you, Brother John, uh, some speculate that Paul did not recognize who the high priest was in, in his response. And so he apologizes for his, com uh, his comment. In verse 6, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. And so this statement causes more of a stir. It's really a distraction. And what he's trying to do is cause a distraction and it reveals the division in the room because in the room, some believed in the resurrection, some do not believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees believe there's no resurrection, and the Pharisees do believe that there is a resurrection. And so again, there's chaos. It involves the chief captain. Uh, verse 11, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, you got to get this here because this plays out later on. Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hadst testified of me in Jerusalem, so much so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now I'm going to be careful in, in, in trying to preach here. I'm going to teach. God gave Paul a word right there. God, sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at all times. God said, Paul, be of good cheer. You're going to get to Rome. We're going to find out how much that means here in just a second. Uh, verses 12 through 22, there's a plot against Paul. And when it was day, certain of the Jews 
uh, banded together, I'm in verse 12, banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were about 40 individuals who made this commitment, this covenant, that they're not going to eat or sleep until Paul is dead. I wonder how long they went. <laughs> yeah, Jasmine, Sister Jasmine, five days. <laughs> They probably didn't hang around much after that because they're like, man, we, we failed. <laughs> we did. It didn't happen. At some point, they got hungry. At some point, they gave up. you got to be careful taking oaths that you can't, you can't stick to. Amen? And so the, the group of would-be assassins, they tell the chief priests and the elders to bring Paul in for a question. And whomever he walks by, there are 40 people in that room ready to stab him. And so they've got everybody standing around, and there's, there's a lot of just people who are there to be there, but then there's 40 assassins ready to kill Paul. And so rather than that taking place, verses 23 through 35, excuse me, I'll get it out here in a minute. Paul is brought to Felix, and he is called unto him two centurions, saying, verse 23, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen 200, at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Felix is Roman. And Paul arrives before Felix, who learns that Paul is from Cilicia, and Paul is allowed to speak. Uh, and, and there's se on several occasions throughout here that Paul is given favor, a lot to do with his Roman citizenship. Now going to chapter 24. Verses 1 through 21, Paul address, his, this is his address to Felix, who is the governor in Caesarea. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullius, who informed the governor against Paul. Tertullius is acting almost like a prosecuting attorney. In verse 2, and when he was called forth, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee, we enjoy great quietness that, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation and by thy, by thy providence. Verse 5, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow <laughs> and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He is a pestilent fellow. Guess what? They called him a pestilent fellow because he was Pushing on their complacency. He, he admitted to himself, we're enjoying great quietness and really good things are happening around here. But this pestilent fellow, hear me right now. The Holy Ghost will be a pestilent fellow to those who are complacent in God's kingdom. And he will push you out of complacency. And we think it's the pastor's fault. We think it's bishop's fault. We think it's one of the two assistant pastors or the Sunday school. But it's the Holy Ghost trying to get you out of complacency and called to a higher calling involved in another, in another area in God's kingdom. Uh, um, all right. Stay on task. And so again, Paul, is, he presents his defense. And so... Let's move on. Verses 22 through 25. I'm sorry. Verses 22 through chapter 25. Paul appears to Caesar. He appeals. I'm sorry. Appeals to Caesar. So Felix decides to delay a ruling. Uh, and there's a commander in Jerusalem who I can't say his name. Can so he's going to wait for him to arrive and to give his account. I want to give a couple quick points here in this area. And you, I'm giving this to you to go home and study more on if you choose. So some quick point, points here. Felix, he listens to Paul about his faith in Christ. And in that conversation, Felix trembles as Paul begins to speak about Jesus. So in this, in this scenario, there's an uprising, there's a trouble. And Felix is replaced with Festus. They're really creative in their names. So now Festus, Festus is in charge. So the high priest and the chief of the Jews, they ask Festus to have Paul brought to Jerusalem. But their whole point of bringing him back to Jerusalem is they, they're going to have assassins waiting along the path to kill Paul. <laughs> Where was it here?
Where's it at? Where's that promise that Paul, that, that God, yeah, there it is, verse 11. Here, they're laying in wait. They're wanting to kill him. But, but God has already given a word. God's already said there's going to be plots against you. There's going to be plans against you, diversions along the way. But I have given a word. You're going to make it to Rome. I, I, I know, I hope you understand this is an illustration and a parallel. When God gives a word, the enemy may be, may be coming against it. I, I felt while I was studying and praying, I'm like, God, who stops your plan? Who, who gets in the way? It can't be the devil because he's not powerful enough. I just felt in my spirit, it's me. It's me that lays down. It's me that quits. It's me that don't go along with God's plan. And we're not even to the hard part yet. There's just accusations being made. So the Jews come out in force and lay many grievous complaints against Paul, none of which can they prove. I worked with a guy at Walmart one time, <laughs> and uh, they loved to pick on him. The man, he was my boss, but all the other bosses above, you know, because Walmart's it's kind of like the government. You've got to have bosses for bosses and the bosses for the bosses, and there's just no, nobody to stock the shelves. It's like, who's going to do this? Justin did. And so they would pick on him about doing something, or he didn't do something, and he would always come, show me the video. <laughs> Prove it. Show me. <laughs> and this was back in the day before, you know, we got stoplight cameras and everything else. And he, because Walmart had cameras all over the place, and he's like, show me the video. And that's what I almost imagine Paul saying, show me the video. Prove it. They couldn't prove it. They were just flapping in the wind. So Festus asked Paul if he could, could go to Jerusalem and face the accusation. And Paul knows well that he has little to no chance of surviving Jerusalem. They're going to kill him there, one way or another. And that's what they've set out to do. But they can't, obviously, because God has another plan. And so he appeals again to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen, and that's, uh, that's what he plans to do. And so Paul uses this to protect himself. Verse 13 through chapter 26. We're getting close. Verse uh, 20, uh, chapter 26, verse 11, Paul addresses uh, Agrippa and Bernice. <laughs> so King Agrippa and Bernice, I believe it's his sister, come to visit Festus and to congratulate, uh, congratulate him on his appointment as procurator. Uh, uh, this term procurator is used, sometimes it was used as a person who oversaw finances, typically for Romans, it was a governor. And so they're coming to congratulate him. So while they're hanging out, they're hanging out for several days, Festus uh, opens up to them about Paul, just like we do as we're hanging out in fellowship. Hey, by, by the way, I've, I've, I've got this issue. I've, I'm facing something. I, I, I want some advice. And so Festus opens up to Agrippa and Bernice about this issue, this Paul issue, and so he wants, King Agrippa wants to speak to Paul himself. And so the next day with a bunch of pomp and circumstance, they present Paul before King Agrippa. And King Agrippa gives Paul the opportunity to speak for himself. Paul qualifies himself about his background. He, uh, he, he mushes him up a little bit with some compliments. And then he tells them that he is persecuted because he, he himself persecuted those who believed in Jesus. And now he believes in Jesus. He's trying to tell him what's going on here. And so Paul recounts his conversion to Agrippa, verses 12 through 32. Paul tells them about what happened on the road to Damascus. And in verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things, which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Hear me, hear pastor, there's a lot of things that I could preach. There's a lot of things that I write down in notepads in my office that never make it to this pulpit. And I'm like, why, God? And I know it's for me. If you study the Word, God's going to give you a Word. It's just for you. 
My mother-in-law called me one day, and she said, man, I was reading my devotions this morning, and she shared it with me. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and I should have said, wow. And she goes, well, it really spoke to me. And I said, I'm sorry, Tina. I, I, I don't know what to say. I said, but that's the way the Word of God works. That when I'm reading the Word of God, God's speaking to me. And then I call up Brother Dan, and he's like, mm-hmm. I've been around him long enough. That would be his response. Mm-hmm. And he means, it. yeah, that's good. I'll think about it, too. <laughs> and that's what I told her. I said, let me marinate on it a little bit, right? It's, it's not a dig or that it wasn't powerful for me or whatever, but God's speaking to you, and if you'll stay in his word, he'll do that on a daily basis. Something that you've read a hundred times, but yet you're in a different season and a different place. You've grown from the person that you were a year ago or two years ago, and it means di something different. It's more meat. Hear me right now. I, I want to say this. Why, Pastor, would you read this same story that Paul has recounted over and over in the book of Acts? That there was an appearing, a light that he could, that was, he said, brighter than the sun. And he said, Who is it, my Lord? And Jesus spoke. Why would you say this? He's, because God gives him a commission here. He says that you're going to go and minister, delivering the. Here, verse 18. You're going to go and you're going to minister to these people to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from pow the power of Satan unto God and from f so they can receive the forgiveness of sins. Hear me. You, it might get old to you, but there's a purpose why what is being preached from this pulpit. It's to open their eyes, to turn people from darkness to light, to turn people from the power of Satan unto God. And if it's anything less than that, I, I'm not sure if it's just fluff or, or, or uh, someone, wants to, someone wants to toot their own horn. Hear me, most of the messages from this pulpit are to turn people, to open up our eyes, to turn you from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God and forgiveness of sins. Hear me, one of these days I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, I don't know how it'll happen, but I'm hoping I can stand somewhere by that pearly gate because the elves are way ahead of some of your names. So we're going to get, <laughs> Brother Jahan, can I share the story? So Sister Cheyenne was somewhere around here, and all the lights were on, and I'd went over to, to get cleaned up for church, and I come back over here, and John, John goes, oh. He goes, I saw Cheyenne's car out there, and I know your car's here, but wasn't nobody in here. I thought the rapture took place. <laughs> the bees are before the elves, but I hope I can get a place by that pearly gate as people walk through. And, the, and for the first time, the reality of eternity sinks into your soul. And all that blabbing about forgiveness and all that blabbing of getting your eyes open and all that turning from darkness to light will say, man, I'm glad pastor didn't stop preaching that. Because when we make it through those pearly gates, honey, it's going to be worth it all. Don't get deterred by that. I'm not going to get deterred by that because I don't know who's going to walk through those doors and sit down in a seat and their eyes are blinded or they're living in darkness or they need forgiveness of their sins. Just get behind pastor and say, I know what he's doing. He's reaching for a soul. He's reaching for that one who's blind because you're good to go. I heard this preach. I don't mean to preach the message again, but it's good. You're good to go, Sister Sherry. I ain't preaching to you in that moment. I'm preaching to that soul that, that needs to experience what you've experienced and what I've experienced. That's what, that's what God told Paul. He says, your job. Anyway. <laughs> so Festus accuses Paul. He says, much learning hath, hath made you mad. I have seen that happen. Much learning has called people, caused people to lose their mind. Paul makes a point that King Agrippa knows what he's talking about. He knows who King Agrippa is, and he knows that King Agrippa is very well versed in the culture of the Jews, in the law of the Jews. Paul knows who he's talking to. This is a very important point here. Many people have preached it. Verse 26, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. 
for this thing has not been done in a corner. Hear me, Jesus, he's going to work. He's, he's, here to, he's here to work so people can see. And Paul asked King Agrippa, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. This is one of the most heartbreaking statements in all of Scripture. And I don't know what verse it is because I didn't write it down. I just wanted to tell you. It's after verse 26, 28. And then Agrippa said to Paul, You've almost persuaded me. Drives me nuts. You almost persuade me to be a Christian. Now hear me right now. Paul could have went back to wherever he was housed at, typically under house arrest with a Roman guard. He, was, he didn't have it too bad at this point. But Brother Walt, he could have went back to that house and beat himself up mentally. He may have, because I've been in them shoes, and said, man, what else could I have said? What else could I have pointed out? What, else, what other dots did I miss? God, what, what scripture did I miss to persuade him? Hear me, I don't believe it was Paul's preaching whatsoever. I believe it was King Agrippa. In my opinion, this is my opinion, not trying to stray away from, from scripture, but I believe it was power social status and money that hindered him from being a Christian I've seen it too often I've seen it man I that breaks my heart uh, who cares pastor he's dead and gone yeah but there's a lot of people in our day and age who we preach our guts out to we teach we love we reach you're doing it I know I know you're doing it and they're almost persuaded but, hey amen, I'm, I'm praying for a total sellout. Chapter 27, uh, verses 1 through 12, Paul is brought to Rome by ship. i got to hurry. We're getting done tonight, 10 minutes. They set out to sail to Rome. They get to the point in a season where the, the seasons are changing. And Paul stands up and he warns them. He warns because he's a prisoner now, and they're shuffling some prisoners to Rome. And he says, listen, this is... You, you got to stop. We need to, we need to bed down here for the winter because we're going to get in trouble. The seas are turning, the winds are turning, and we're going to have a hard time. They're at a place called Fair Havens. And so he's trying to, to convince them to stay there. His advice is dismissed, and they carry on. Uh, the next, this is how much he knows about the weather. Because the next section, verses 13 through 38, are simply titled, The Storm. He tried to tell them that bad things are about to happen. And uh, it cracked me up when I was typing my notes out, Brother Jim. And it just titled, The Storm. At first they believed, because at first when they set out into the waters, Bishop, there was a south wind blowing. They felt good. But just in a very short amount of time, the winds changed. And they called this... Uh, you got your brother Ben thank you I'm going to give him a mic while I preach to say these hard words amen say it loud that's it and it means a storm from the east or a violent agitation now I don't know about you but there's been a lot of new weather terms come out here lately uh, uh, a derecho is that what the new term huh uh, yeah, one of those. There's all these new weather terms. I'm like, where do they come from? We Back in the day, there was a thunder shower, a thunderstorm, and a shower. That's all you got on the news. And now they don't even say thunder shower. I'm like, man, this was a thunder shower. This was not a thunderstorm. Anyway, and so the storm lasts many days. You'll see in Scripture for 14 days at least. And so they're barely able to survive. Hear me, in the storm, Sister Brooke, that word from God back in the previous chapters has not changed. The boat is rocking. The waves are tumultuous. But God's word still has said, Paul, you're going to make it to Rome. Right. <laughs> oh, man. So they're fighting for their lives. I don't, I, I, uh, Tiff and I were able to get away for our anniversary. And we had a little bit of a rocky boat the whole time. We got back. It literally took me a week to walk straight down the sidewalk. It was terrible. And um, I, I get a sense of that every once in a while in the trailer because it has a little shimmy to it. And I'm like, okay, Lord, help me here. And, um, and so this is funny to me. 
because you know it doesn't take much to, to crack me up. These men are weary from fighting that boat, that wind, and the waters to stay afloat. They're doing everything they can, everything they know to do. And Paul stands up in the middle of the boat and he says, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from creek and to have gained this harm and loss. I don't know about you, Bishop, but no one else that I know of on that boat was Holy Ghost filled. And if I was on that boat, I would have just ran to him and threw him off the boat. Would you please shut up? Please don't state the obvious, right? Captain obvious. You should. I told you so. Mimi has told us not to say that. Don't, ta- don't say told you so. And that is hard. I don't like that one. <laughs> but he has a word from them. He tells them that during the night while he was, it doesn't say he was sleeping. It just says during the night that an angel of the Lord stood by Paul and said, no one on the ship's going to die. You see, because I've already given a word. And that word not only now affects you, but it affects everybody on this boat now. Yo, I hope you know where I'm swinging. And so they finally see land. They drop four anchors, but guess what? That's not always a good, a good idea. And they cut uh, the anchors. They're fighting with all their life. We're coming to a, we're, we're on the, we're, the wheels are down. And so verse 39 Uh, Through 44 in my Bible, it's titled The Shipwreck. So we went from the storm to the shipwreck. And so they're able finally, Sister Jan, to ram the boat onto the beach. And the the Bible says that the front of the boat is locked in, but the back of the boat is being battered by the the water. And uh, it is crushed. It's broken all up. Eventually, everybody makes it to, to the land, safe and sound. And I guarantee you, Paul would have said, where's my Zoom conference call sign-in? And no more boats for me. So verse, chapter 28, verses 1 through uh, 13, Paul is in Malta. And so they realize where they are. They get on the island, they realize where they are. The inhabitants there uh, are friendly. And they build a fire and they begin to help them because the storm is still going on. And we know this story. Paul is gathering wood for the fi- fire. And as he lays the fire on lays the wood on the fire he's quite the man of miraculous he's carrying fire around no he's carrying the wood to lay on the fire and as he does that a viper jumps out of the out of the heat and strikes Paul on the hand and the Bible says that Paul just shook it off and sat down with his cup of tea I don't know if that's what they were drinking I don't know apostolics drink coffee no I'm teasing (laughs) I'm teasing all the, uh, the Chamberlains go, no, they don't. They drink hot tea. <laughs> Amen. Now, this is, again, a funny story to me. Because they're whispering. Man, they just this dude just barely survived a shipwreck. He must be a murderer. Because now fate has caught up with him, and he's about to puff up and die. And the Bible says, because I don't read the Bible like you do, the Bible says they sat there and they gawked at him. Any moment, he's going to swell up and fall over dead. You see, because they knew what that viper was, and it had happened to them. They're just waiting. But what they don't know is, God has given a word to Paul. You're going to make it to Rome. There might be assassins in the way. There may be accusers along the way. There may be a shipwreck along the way. There may be a snake going to bite you on your, on your hand. But hear me, when God gives a word and he says you're going to Rome, I'm, I'm not talking you're going to Rome, but I'm talking about a destination, a word from God. It got, nothing will get in the way of God's word. Man, you, that'll cause you to stand up in the boat and tell somebody you should have listened to me. We weren't eventually got there, but we didn't have to go through this. <laughs> I, I just picture them, a buddy of mine growing up, he had a hard time being turned around in his seat and paying attention to church because his dad played the drums. Bobby Thompson, you know, this is a hero in my life. Jason, my buddy, he always sat on the front row right in front of us, and he'd turn around. And Mama Ferguson was, because Jason's mom didn't come to church for many, many years. And Jason, turn around. Because that's how Mama talked to everybody. And so he'd, he'd get bored again and 
just wondering what's going on. He should have sat on the back row. He wouldn't have to turn around. But I can just picture all these people sitting around like Jason Thompson on the front row at church waiting for Paul to fall over and die. But God gave a word. And I feel like somebody needs to hear that today. Hallelujah. God gave a word, Dan Rutledge. God gave a word, Will Aldridge. Amen. So Paul's headed to Rome. And there's two people that meet Paul before he ever makes it to Rome. I think this is so cool. 40 miles from Rome. Somebody's heard Paul's coming. 40 miles from Rome. There's a group that has left. See, this, this ain't... This ain't jump in your car, drive 40 miles in just a little, little second. These people had to travel and labor. To, they heard Paul was coming. And then some 30 miles from Rome, so there's, a, there's one group, and then another group some 30 miles from Rome has come out and, and greets Paul. And the Bible says this simple statement that Paul was encouraged. And can I tell the church, the apostolic church in 22, we are, we are called to encourage one another. I, I've been planning this, and we're going to do it soon. I'm going to plan, Sister Chamberlain. Not to, I'm not kicking anybody out. I'm not my goal. But I, I want to be, a, I want to be a greeter. I want to be a host, whatever we call it. Call me whatever, because I love seeing people come to the house of God. And I'm not going to stand by the door. I'm going, to, I'm going to walk down the sidewalk. I think we need. I need to be encouraged. I'm encouraged when you're in the house of God. I hope you're encouraged. When you're in the house of God. I love seeing my friends come to the house of God. I love seeing Clay and Faith come. And they don't busybody themselves. They go straight to that chair. On their knees. Praying and weeping before God. I love seeing Jahan. If you can't laugh around Jahan. You must be dead. He's holding it back right now. He can't even hardly stand it. Because he don't quite laugh. He fills up the room laughing. I love it Jahan. Don't stop coming to the house of God because you bless your pastor. We need to encourage one another. As the devil fights more and more, let's get around people who encourage us and strengthen us and speak a good word in us. Go 40 miles and meet them before they ever get to Rome. Let them know that they're, you're glad they're there. The book of Acts ends this way, verse 31, talking about Paul preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Most other books, and I've got a few here, they end. The author puts the period, amen, puts the pen down, and they're done. Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, Romans, Hebrews, just random books in the Bible that there's an end to the book, but not Acts. We're still living it out. The acts continue. The acts of the apostles. Hear me. I hope you've enjoyed this study as much as I have. I don't know if I did it for you or if I just did it for me. Let's all stand. Hear me. I still believe that book's being written right now. The Holy Ghost is still being poured out. People are still being healed. People still being delivered from drugs and alcohol and any other, any other addiction. People are still making their way back to Jesus Christ. I, I heard all over social media as we were sharing things amongst preachers and pastors and all that. I think it was uh, 51 at the Pentecostals of Alexandria that got the Holy Ghost. 51 people on Sunday got the Holy Ghost at POA. That's a, you say, well, Pastor, that's a big church. That's right. Praise God. Let them grow till they have to build another building. What was it, Brother, uh, Brother Arango? Uh, pastor, pastor's wife, did y'all hear this? Pastor's wife comes through from Chicago, says, hey, I need to go get my husband. Husband says, yeah, God told me I need to go to the East Coast. Something's going to happen. They bring their church to uh, Newport, Newport News, Virginia, to an apostolic church. Forty-one of them got the Holy Ghost just a couple weeks ago. For, it's the book of Acts still being written Some people will say Some denom, denominations say No the Holy Ghost ended And they take one scripture out of context They don't know what they're talking about Hear me The Holy Ghost is still being poured out It's about to happen in front row It may happen over three years and five years You just stay The Holy Ghost is being poured out 
the Acts of the Apostles is still being written. You're the book of Acts. Church, alive and well and strong. And, 20, and we ain't going anywhere until that trumpet sounds. Uh-huh. Oh, man, let's pray. Why don't you grab your neighbor by the hand? Be an encouragement. Pray so they can hear you pray. Father, I thank you for my friends. Thank you for my family. Oh, I pray your blessings over every single one of them. As they go home tonight, I pray that you'd keep them safe. I pray, Lord, that we can be a light to the world. I pray that Holy Ghost burns inside of us. And everywhere they, everywhere we go, people hear you. They hear your name. They hear your hope. They hear your salvation. Every time I open my mouth, I'm going to be like Paul, talking about Jesus, connecting the dots, teaching them about hope and salvation and deliverance. I want everybody to know this life that I'm living. I want everybody to know this life. 